in the previous lecture we discussed about how a design response spectrum is constructed and then uh, we discussed about the design earthquakes then we uh, uh, discussed on the site specific spectrum then uniform hazard spectrum and uh, uh, then we discussed about uh, the uh, how one can obtain the artificial ground motion from the response spectrum and uh, the uh, power spectral density function of the ground motion. Uh, the generation of this artificial ground motions are extremely important uh, because uh, many a time when we have to perform a nonlinear analysis we cannot uh, use the response spectrum or power spectral density function as input. In that case, we have to uh, provide uh, inputs as the time histories of ground motion. To obtain the power spectral, uh, to obtain the time histories corresponding to a specified power spectral density, uh, density function or uh, to obtain a time history of ground motion corresponding to a target response spectrum. There are uh, many standard programs which are available these days and one can use those uh, standard programs. Uh, the uh, methodology how they, these programs work uh, that what we have discussed in the previous lecture. Now, uh, in a region where we have a number of uh, ground motion record available and other earthquake data, measured data, uh, then one can have a, a description of the seismic input as power spectral density function or a Fourier spectrum or a response spectrum or one can provide the uh, possible peak ground acceleration uh, and uh, many other uh, seismic uh, parameters that are used as input for analyzing the structures or performing any kind of seismic analysis of structures. However, uh, there are many places where the recorded data are not sufficient and therefore, this kind of exercise cannot be done. Also, wherever we have uh, many data collected uh, over a long period of time, then from those data, uh, the researchers uh, wanted to find out some empirical equations uh, for describing the power spectral density function of or for describing the response spectrum or for describing the Fourier spectrum or the impact relationship for duration of earthquake or different kinds of attenuation laws. And uh, mm, the, these exercises have been done in the past and people came out with uh, different uh, kinds of uh, empirical uh, formulas uh, which can be used for predicting those seismic parameters. So, today's discussion uh, is uh, based on, on that, that how we can obtain uh, different kinds of, of uh, seismic parameter uh, which will uh, be used for future earthquake or in other words um, how to predict those seismic input, input parameters. Now, the seismic input parameters uh, are obtained uh, from the past earthquake data in different regions and there are several uh, uh, predictive uh, laws or predictive equations and one has to choose uh, the, the most appropriate one for the region in question. Uh, and uh, this uh, selection of the uh, the uh, selection of the predictive uh, relationships, uh, they require a careful consideration of the geology of the region, geographical condition and the 
uh, geotechnical condition that is the soil condition of a particular region. And one has to see what uh, uh, are the similar conditions uh, existing for other regions for which the predictive equations are available. And then uh, one can use those uh, predictive uh, equations uh, for the uh, for predicting seismic input parameters. Uh, many in many cases, uh, the uh, some uh, some kind of adjustments are uh, made uh, based on the uh, the uh, geological, uh, geographical, and geotechnical parameters for the region, and uh, with those modifications those predictive relationships uh, can be used. Now, uh, the uh, seismic input parameters and ground motion parameters uh, are generally directly available from the recorded data as I told you. And uh, one uh, uses uh, those uh, empirical equations. Uh, for predictive purposes. The predictive relationships are generally expressed uh, in the form of a function of magnitude, the epicentral distance and any other important parameter. For example, it could be peak ground acceleration, it could be intensity or it could be any other uh, uh, quantity of interest. They are developed based on certain consideration. Uh, the equation 2.40 uh, shows the uh, function or the um, predictive equation and its form. It is generally a function of magnitude, epicentral distance and the any other important parameter and that is what I uh, told before. The important thing is that in obtaining this uh, equation, it is generally assumed that the all the parameters are log normally distributed. Now, this assumption has uh, come because of the reason that uh, the these parameters uh, which are recorded uh, in different regions were statistically analyzed and uh, it was found that most of these parameters uh, tend to follow a log normal distribution. Secondly, uh, in obtaining the uh, attenuation law, it was observed that decrease in wave amplitude with distance bears an inverse relationship. And then the energy absorption due to material damping causes amplitudes decrease exponentially and uh, this was also uh, seen from the previous earthquake data. And uh, the epicentral distance r that what is uh, generally we uh, consider uh, is always uh, greater than on the actual epicentral distance because the uh, earthquake source moves in a uh, from one point to the other in a line source or in area source. Therefore, it is very difficult to uh, precisely talk about a, a, an epicentral distance. Therefore, the act epicentral distance that is considered in these equations are always uh, greater than the epicent actual epicentral distance. The mean value of the parameter is obtained from the equation or the predictive relationships and there is a standard deviation which is specified uh, that is the, uh, the mean value is uh, provided in terms of log uh, value and the standard deviation also is in terms of sigma ln of the parameter. 
probability of exceedance is given by uh, uh, this re simple relationship that is uh, probability of any seismic input parameter being greater than equal to a specified value is equal to 1 minus a p where the p is defined by this that is ln y minus ln y bar divided by sigma ln y. Uh, ln y bar is the log of the uh, value specified value and ln y bar is the uh, mean value uh, of the uh, parameter and sigma ln y is the, the standard deviation. So, this normalized quantity is uh, taken as the value of p and a p obviously follows a normal distribution and there are standard charts which are available for a uh, standard normal variate and from that one can easily find out the value of a p and hence probability of exceedance of uh, certain parameter uh, can be obtained easily. Many predictive relationships, uh, laws and empirical equations exist. Most widely used ones are given in the textbook and uh, uh, the uh, ones which uh, are widely used are described uh, here now and let us see one by one um, those predictive relationship uh, that are widely used and are given in the book. Uh, for example, the peak horizontal acceleration uh, and peak horizontal velocity, they were proposed by Esteva to be an exponential function like this exponential function of magnitude m and one can see that the d r the epicentral distance is uh, not is taken as r plus 25 and that is what we uh, discussed before that means the epicentral distance uh, is increased by some value. Then uh, the peak horizontal velocity that is again an exponential function of magnitude m and one can see that here the epicentral distance also is increased by uh, some value. So, from uh, these two equations given a particular value of magnitude m and an epicentral distance one can find out what is the peak horizontal acceleration and what is the peak horizontal velocity. Similarly, Campbell uh, gave another uh, uh, predictive law for the peak horizontal acceleration and that was from the data set that he analyzed and there the PHA is uh, given uh, in terms of the G unit here. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, this p h m is given in terms of centimeter per second square and obviously this is in centimeter per second. So, log of p h a in g unit is again a linear function of magnitude m and uh, the l n of the epicentral distance r and we see that the epicentral distance r is again increased by uh, uh, certain uh, quantity. Toro uh, obtained another expression for peak horizontal acceleration in g unit and uh, his uh, equation relates the uh, moment magnitude m w with the p h value and the epicentral distance. The uh, sigma r value is uh, given by this that means the r m 
here that is the uh, mean value of the uh, r and there is a standard deviation which is uh, specified for the epicentral distance r and they are uh, uh, given you know, for this particular bounds over here. And the standard deviation for the uh, PHA is given by this that is sigma square m plus sigma square r. So, we assume here in this particular equation or Toro assumed that the, uh, the uh, sigma value of PHA will be related to the sigma value of m and sigma value of r that is r is considered here again as a random variable like magnitude m. Uh, next, uh, there was an attempt to relate the peak uh, horizontal velocity of the ground with the intensity of earthquake. And if you remember, I uh, said that the intensity of earthquake uh, is a subjective measure, uh, whereas PHV is something which we expect that we should be able to measure, but this subjective quantity has been used to find out uh, a quantity which can be measured. So, this is the uh, equation that uh, uh, Rosenbluth observed uh, that the PHV maintains with the intensity of uh, earthquake. Similarly, the Cornell uh, obtained in a relationship between the intensity of earthquake and the magnitude of earthquake, where the magnitude of earthquake again is a quantity which can be measured, whereas intensity of earthquake is a subjective one. But from the uh, recorded data of the earthquake and the kinds of damages and destructions that were observed, uh, the people have tried to equate i with m uh, using this particular equation and this Cornell's equation is widely used in relating i with m, where r is the epicentral distance and h is the focal depth. Then Gutenberg uh, gave a very important relationship between the energy released and the magnitude of earthquake. So, uh, for a given magnitude of earthquake, one can assess what was the energy released and this equation is widely used in the literature in relating the magnitude of earthquake with the energy release. Joyner and Boer provided uh, another empirical equation for the peak horizontal velocity and uh, that is a function of magnitude of earthquake. This magnitude of earthquake is the local magnitude and the epicentral distance r and we can see that the uh, it is not simply 1 r, but r is uh, you know uh, is increased by some value. Here the j 1, j 2, j 3, j 4, j 5 and j 6, they are, are the constants which are variable uh, in the sense that it may vary from region to region and one can get a, a particular set of value for this uh, con constants uh, while using this uh, equation for a particular region. Duration of earthquake. Uh, also has been uh, attempted uh, uh, to uh, for, for prediction. So, the duration of earthquake T uh, which uh, people observed uh, could be related to the magnitude of earthquake and the epicentral distance and uh, this is a exponential function of magnitude. Uh, so, with the help of this, 
the duration of earthquake can be predicted uh, for a particular region if enough data is not available about the duration of earthquake. Next is the Fourier amplitude spectra that we uh, discussed in the uh, previously and Fourier amplitude spectra provides the frequency contents of the ground motion and as an, import, as an important uh, predictive parameter for um, performing a frequency domain analysis of structures. And this is uh, uh, given with the help of this equation and one can see here uh, the constants which are involved over here is Fc and uh, that is the uh, a frequency which is uh, called the, uh, the critical frequency or cutoff frequency and then F is the usual frequency. So, the amplitude Fourier amplitude spectrum is expressed in terms of the frequency obviously it can be converted to time period because frequency uh, bears an inverse relationship with time period and these uh, fc is uh, related to the um, moment magnitude m0 and the uh, shear wave velocity and the constant c over here is dependent on the uh, shear wave velocity uh, with the help of this relationship. Now, uh, these uh, constants that means the value of the shear wave velocity f and uh, delta uh, sigma. So, these uh, values may differ from um, the side to side and using uh, the sp uh, specific combination of values for a particular site, one can obtain a Fourier amplitude spectra uh, by using this equation. Next, uh, people also try to obtain the empirical uh, relationships for the spec uh, response spectrum or velocity response spectrum S v. So, this is uh, time period dependent. So, log S v t is given by this equation and one can see that it is related to the uh, m w magnitude and epicentral distance r and the number of constants. So, these constants again vary from region to region and by substituting appropriate values of this constant for a particular region, one can get an estimate of the uh, S v that is the pseudo velocity spectrum ordinates at different uh, time period t. Similarly, this equation is used for obtaining the acceleration response spectrum ordinate for different uh, period t and this is related to the magnitude again magnitude of earthquake and the epicentral distance r. And this a t, b t and c t they are again site dependent and one has to find out this constants a t, b t, c t and uh, in, in some cases uh, these a t, b t, c t they are plotted. Uh, the plots are available and these plots are with respect to the period t. Another uh, expression for the pseudo velocity spectrum ordinate S v uh, that was obtained by this and here one can see that uh, for different period given period t one can calculate uh, the value of the pseudo velocity spectrum. So, therefore, uh, this, this in fact will be a function of t uh, and uh, this is also dependent upon the surface magnitude uh, m s and the epicentral distance r.
next uh, um, uh, it relationship predictive relationships were obtained uh, for power spectral density function of ground motion and there are several um, such expressions which are available. Now, one can see that uh, this is uh, expressed in terms of the ratio of omega by omega g, where omega is the frequency uh, against which we plot the power spectral density of ground motion. Omega g is the predominant frequency of the ground through which the seismic waves passes from the rock bed to the surface. So, for that soil medium one can find out the predominant uh, frequency of that ground and xi g is the again damping associated with the uh, soil. The concept here is that uh, the ground motion while travelling from the rock bed to the surface get modified due to the soil condition and depending upon the soil predominant frequency and damping it takes a shape of the power spectral density function. That is the shape uh, there is a change in shape between the power spectral density function which is recorded or uh, which is obtained at the rock bed and which is uh, obtained at the surface. Now, this is again another uh, what we call expression empirical equation for the uh, power spectral density function. Uh, these uh, the values are instead of omega g etcetera they are specified values that is for a particular class of, uh, of the soil condition this is valid. Uh, there is another uh, uh, equation uh, which is uh, of uh, this type where these constants are specified. So, uh, they are uh, valid for a particular uh, region. The general type of uh, the um, power spectral density function equation uh, was provided by uh, Clough and Pengin. Here the concept is that the power spectral density function that exists at the rock bed level that gets filtered through two filtering medium and uh, the frequency response functions square or absolute value of the frequency response function square are given by this equation and by this equation. So, this is for filter 1 and this is for the filter 2 and uh, the, the predominant uh, frequency for the filter 1 is omega g and for filter 2 it is omega f. Similarly, the damping constant for the two filters they vary. Now, this was a, a modification of the uh, power spectral density function expression given by this equation. Now, here uh, the uh, the form of the equation is of this type that means there is only one particular uh, filter existing and the rock bed power spectral density function gets modified through one filter that means the entire soil is considered as one filter and that obtained uh, uh, that that gave a relationship uh, uh, between the surface power spectral density function and the rock bed power spectral density function. Now, this was a this was modified to these two filter uh, concept of power spectral density function because of the reason that 
uh, this is not able to provide a an adequate or correct value of the power spectral density function of displacement at the zero frequency. Whereas, this expression when we use the double filter they can uh, provide the uh, correct value or some finite value uh, to the power spectral density function of displacement at zero frequency. Next we come to the coherence function that we uh, discussed before. Uh, the coherence functions they are used for obtaining the cross power spectral density function uh, of the ground motion between two points. Uh, so, uh, uh, we work out uh, on say the um, power cross power spectral density function between two points 1 and 2 uh, as S x 1, S x 2 to be is equal to S x 1 to the power half into S x 2 to the power half multiplied by a coherence function that was a function of omega and the distance between the two points r. So, this is uh, how a cross power spectral density function between two points that is computed. S x 1 and S x 2 are the power spectral density function of the ground motion may be power spectral density function of acceleration at these two points. And for a homogeneous field we generally assume that the power spectral density function of ground acceleration at these two points are the same as a result of that one can write down the cross power spectral density function as S x of this coherence function. So, if one knows or if the power spectral density function of the ground motion in terms of acceleration or displacement uh, they are uh, given then one can find out the cross power spectral density function provided one uh, knows the coherence function. So, different forms of the coherence function uh, that is uh, given in the literature. Here uh, this is a coherence function and uh, one can see that this is a exponentially again decaying function with a gamma function uh, that is the distance between the two points and is a function of omega and this uh, function is more precisely written over here this is also a exponentially decaying function with uh, the shear wave velocity coming into picture. So, using uh, this into this over here one can get a coherence function which will be a, a multiplication of two exponentially decaying function. A very popular uh, coherence function which is used in uh, many cases is given by this expression. So, this is a again exponentially decaying function with a constant c specifier r is the distance between the two points and omega is the frequency and v is the shear wave velocity uh, of the earthquake. So, this particular equation uh, is in uh, as is a real quantity it does not have any imaginary component and as a result of that provided we know the value of r that is the distance between the point x 1 and x 2 then uh, one can easily obtain a value of the coherence function only in terms of omega because v s will be specified c will be specified then one can get the coherence function uh, only as a function of omega and S x is also given as a function of omega. 
therefore sx1 sx2 can be easily expressed for each frequency that we consider in our analysis uh, this is another coherence function uh, that is reported in the literature uh, this uh, is in the form of a harmonic function that is a cosine function and uh, an exponential function uh, that is with uh, the distance uh, this uh, exponentially decays and uh, uh, this uh, form of the coherence function uh, was obtained and, uh, from the recorded data in uh, Tawaiwan and uh, an exercise was done there uh, with the available data to find out different forms of the coherence function and uh, uh, one set of data happened to coincide with uh, this kind of empirical equation. The general form of the coherence function uh, represented by this equation is given over here where we can see that this is a, a, a exponential function of a imaginary quantity i. So, therefore, one can uh, write it in the form of a, a real part cosine and an imaginary part which will be a sine. So, uh, uh, this particular form of the coherence function is uh, a complex quantity becomes a complex quantity a in the form of a plus i b and then s x 1 s x 2 no more remains a real quantity, but a complex quantity. But uh, in the uh, in the problems uh, uh, of uh, probabilistic analysis of structures using spectral analysis, uh, there is absolutely no problem in tackling S x 1, S x 2 as a complex function. In fact, it is, uh, um, uh, it is logical that the um, cross power spectral density function terms would be a complex function or a complex quantity rather than a real quantity. Uh, however, if we use this particular form of the equation which is a special form uh, uh, of this one, then we get the cross power spectral density function as the real quantity. Uh, then we have a number of uh, uh, expressions uh, for the modulating function and the uh, modulating function that uh, uh, we talked of in the previous uh, lecture uh, that modulates a stationary process to a uniformly modulated non-stationary process or we call uniformly modulated uh, power spectral density function which is also known as the evolutionary power spectral density function. And there uh, we had seen that the um, power spectral density function x x of the earthquake is multiplied by a modulating function h t square and this gives the value of the power spectral density function as a function of omega and t both. So, various forms of uh, the modulating function that were uh, observed from the recorded data. Uh, this is a very simple one which is a modulating function of this type that is a rectangular modul modulating function. Then one can have a modulating function which is of a type like this that is uh, not exactly trapezoidal type, 
because these two are nonlinear curves, but it has a form of a trapezoidal function. Then one can have an exponential function as the these are for the exponential function or rather the, rather this is an exponential function and uh, uh, with the help of this modulating function one can obtain a power spectral density function which is a, is a uniformly mod modulated at, uh, power spectral density function used for uh, obtaining the response of structures for eventually uh, power, uh, eventually power spectral density function of earthquake. So, uh, we see that uh, a number of predictive relationship uh, that exist uh, in the literature and uh, one can use any one of these predictive relationships for uh, performing the seismic analysis of structures. Uh, mostly in regions where we do not have enough earthquake data, we look for uh, these predictive relationship to uh, predict the future form of the future earthquake uh, that will be uh, given as an input uh, for the analysis. Now, in using this predictive relationship, one has to take care of the local geological geotechnical and geographical conditions and many a time the constants of the empirical equations are adjusted for these uh, uh, conditions. So, the uh, uh, predictive relationship as such are very useful uh, in obtaining the seismic response of structures uh, for a, a variety of uh, cases. And we will uh, see later that for uh, the uh, random vibration analysis of structures using the uh, using the spectral analysis technique, we uh, use these uh, equations of the power spectral density functions or various forms of predict, you know, power spectral density functions that I have shown you. And out of that, the double filtered uh, power spectral density function uh, is uh, widely used for obtaining the response of the uh, structure to a, a specified power spectral uh, density function. And this uh, double filtered uh, power spectral density function is uh, obtained with the concept that the power spectral density function of ground motion that exist at the rock bed gets filtered uh, through two filters and the concept of two filters were used uh, for finding out a finite or a reasonable value of the power spectral density function of displacement at 0 frequency. If you use uh, the single uh, filter uh, for obtaining the power spectral density function or at the uh, ground surface, given the power spectral density function of ground motion at the rock bed, uh, then uh, we get uh, a, a situation, get into a situation where the power spectral density of you know, displacement at 0 frequency remains. Uh, um, undefined. Similarly, the uh, power, uh, the response spectrum ordinates uh, for future earthquakes uh, can be uh, used uh, and uh, the analysis of structures can be carried out uh, with the help of uh, these predictive uh, relationships given uh, for the uh, response spectrum of acceleration or velocity. Uh, there are uh, cases where uh, the response spectrum ordinates 
uh, using the empirical relationship has been also used for uh, obtaining the seismic hazard analysis of uh, structures or seismic hazard analysis of regions uh, of, uh, in order to find out the uh, hazard or the probability of exceedance of certain uh, um, value of the response spectrum ordinates. Now, here uh, uh, three examples are uh, solved over here. PH and PHV, they were calculated uh, using uh, different empirical equations and compared. Uh, they were obtained for a magnitude of earthquake 7 and epicentral distance of 75 and 120. The comparison uh, shows that the PHA calculated by different equations give different values for the same epicentral distance. For example, Esteva, his uh, equation provided PHA of the order of 0 0.034, Campbell his equation provided a PHA of 0 0.056, then Bojorgina his uh, equation provided 0 0.03 which is quite comparable with the 0 0.034, then Toro is 0 0.072 and Trifunak his uh, equation uh, gave a value which is a wide departure from all other values. At 120 kilometer distance, we can see that there is a similarity between Esteva and Borogina and uh, this and this they have a good similarity, Toros and the Campbell and again there is a, a large departure uh, of the uh, PHA calculated by the equation of Tifunak. Similarly, the PHV was uh, compared, Esteva's equation provided 8.535 which is very high compared to the um, other two equations given by uh, Joyner and Rosenbluth. At 120 kilometer distance, they were more or less, uh, uh, they are, they are uh, uh, very much near to each other, whereas uh, this was uh, very much different. Then we uh, compared the smooth normalized Fourier spectrum obtained from El Centro earthquake and that given by Magway's equation and the uh, this was for uh, the these specified values F max was taken as 10 hertz. Fc was taken as 0.2 hertz, Mw was taken as 7, R was taken as 100 kilometer, Vs 1500 and meter per second and we can see that the, the Fourier amplitude spectrum obtained by this equation and the El Centro earthquake, they seem to compare quite well. So, uh, the uh, expression that is uh, given by Magwe's equation for the Fourier amplitude spectrum seems to provide a uh, good approximation to the Fourier amplitude spectrum uh, when the earthquake is broad banded earthquake because we know that El Centro earthquake is a broad band earthquake. Then uh, compare uh, between the normalized spectrums obtained by IBC, Euro 8, IS 1893 and that given by Boer et al. So, here the response spectrums which was normalized of course with PGA value. So, the shape of this response spectrums were obtained for uh, the various constants which are uh, given in the Boer's equation like B1 to B6, these constants were 
taken from table 3.9 given in the book g c is equal to 0 and p g a was taken as 0 0.35 g that is the normalized spectrums uh, were normalized with respect to 0 0.35 g. And uh, this is the comparison which we see. Uh, we can see that uh, Euro code and IS code they are more or less the same. IBC code and the Boers, they were IBC code was this and the Boers uh, 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 response spectrum is this. So, at this region of course, is fairly matching in this region and in fact, in this following region it is more or less matching, but there is a departure here, wide departure in the beginning of the time period. Then we uh, compared the power spectral density functions of ground acceleration given by uh, different uh, expressions. For example, Haus Hausner and Jennings, Newmark and Rosenblatt, Kanai and Tajimi and Klaff and Penjin. Kanai, Tajimi and Klaff and Penjin, they are uh, widely used for most of the uh, analysis. And we see that the uh, there is a very good what we call uh, matching between the Clough and Penjim, Kanai Tajimi and Hausner Jennings, whereas the Newmark and Rosenblatt that tends to uh, differ uh, uh, quite a bit from them. So, this shows that uh, we have uh, different kinds of uh, spectrums given by different equations and which one is to be used uh, depends upon the local condition, but uh, the uh, most widely ones which are used in the literature, uh, they have a, a, a they are found to uh, match with most of the power spectral density function that are obtained. Uh, uh, in the database and therefore, uh, the ones we generally accept uh, for you know, predicting the future earthquake can be um, uh, taken uh, for those uh, or from, from those equations. In general, the predictive relationships all the predictive relationship that I have shown that is for the peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, peak horizontal acceleration, peak horizontal velocity, then response spectrum, Fourier spectrum and the uh, power spectral density function including the modulating functions. Uh, they are available uh, in the literature, some of them I have uh, uh, shown over here. There are more uh, and uh, in the many websites these predictive relationships uh, are given. For uh, analyzing uh, a structure, uh, we use various forms of seismic inputs. These seismic inputs, if they are not uh, directly uh, given as a time history, then one has to rely on these uh, predictive relationships in order to describe the Fourier amplitude spectrum or the response spectrum or the power spectral density function of earthquake. And attenuation relationships are quite extensively used in determining the peak ground acceleration or peak ground velocity of earthquake give for a given magnitude. Uh, and epicentral distance. So, uh, these uh, uh, quantities uh, are um, uh, used in both probabilistic analysis of structures as well as the deterministic uh, earthquake analysis of structures. When we uh, use the deterministic analysis of structures, generally either we uh, use response spectrum. Uh, 
spectrums provided and these response spectrums uh, are usually the design response spectrums specified in the code. With the help of these design response spectrum, one can perform a uh, seismic response spectrum method of analysis, which is an elegant method and very easy uh, to uh, follow and therefore, widely used uh, in earthquake engineering. The main reason for this is that the entire earthquake analysis can be carried out statically.